Hello, and welcome to The Everyday Marksman, the podcast where it's all about tactical skills for living a more adventurous life. I'm your host, Matt Robertson. Welcome back. It's good to see you again. I have been pretty busy, and, well, I don't need to get into it. Say life has been a little wild. It's summer, it's fall, and a lot's going on. Not the least of which is the election season, which is kind of tangentially the impetus for today's podcast episode. So welcome to the Everyday Marksman. Our website's everydaymarksman.co. There you'll find today's show notes and our awesome community of Marksman. Be sure to come by and sign up. No long intro today. Let's get to the topic. You see, I'm not really a political blog or podcast, so I usually stay away from the topic. But I also realize that participating and advocating for gun culture is an inherently political activity to begin with. So some things just can't be avoided. And I started drafting what I was going to say in this one way back during the first attempt on President Trump's life during the campaign. And then I backed away, left it in the draft folder to rot away. Interest picked up again after some more high profile events and it was all over the news. And I kept convincing myself to just sit on it. Well, now the election is over. I think there's a clearer path for what's to come next in the next several months and years. And I want to touch on that briefly. So I'm going to start off by saying, to reiterate, this is not a political post. I'm not going to discuss the reasonings for who won and lost the election. Rather, I'm focusing on what's been happening in the gun control sphere over the last several years, where the momentum seems to be going and what I think is going to happen, as well as what you should look out for, right? So um, this is a bit of me pontificating, if you will. So let me give you some history here. I have been debating gun control in some capacity since about 2007, well before I was even serious into shooting. And at the time, I considered myself someone who was an interest in gun, an interest in guns, who had an interest in guns. I'm not even going to edit that out, whatever. But I wasn't really an enthusiast. I was a video game nerd who who came to the culture, right? I spent many hours going back and forth on various forums and social media at the time, which was like MySpace, and honing my arguments. But I didn't really get serious until about 2010, 2011. It was just in time for the debate to pick up around 2012 when Sandy Hook happened. And we all thought that there was going to be some traumatic push for more gun control uh, in President Obama's second term. To be fair, there actually was. He just didn't have Congress to back him. And frankly, I lost a lot of kind of casual friends during that time when they realized I was on the other side of the fence from them. uh, And I didn't just want to nod along in agreement with whatever they were saying. And I said I kind of pointed out the flaws in their logic. Uh, That was kind of my first exposure to losing friends over politics, to be honest. Now, I kept that momentum up for a few years, and through all of it, I kind of saw the cycles of arguments that would gain popularity and then fall to the wayside, both for and against. And I knew the core tenets of Heller and McDonald's SCOTUS decisions, and I pointed them out every time when they were getting twisted by the other side. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, the two most common examples I see those decisions getting kind of wound around is the concept of dangerous and unusual. So back in the Heller decision, there was a line in there about uh, generally everything should be fine or illegal as long as it's not dangerous and unusual. And what happens today is a lot of anti-gun courts and decisions are twisting that around to say dangerous or unusual, uh, which is a much broader definition than dangerous and unusual. And another common one is also from Heller, where they discussed that weapons that were commonly owned for lawful purposes, which today often gets twisted around to be commonly used for self-defense. And then they build an entire argument around, well, it's not actually used for self-defense. And that's not what Heller said. Of course, no, Heller said commonly owned for lawful purposes, which is entirely different. Anyway, I'm not going to rabbit hole, I promise. Just showing how some of the cases back then have specific words and phrases that are getting twisted around and and are seeing if nobody's paying attention, which I am. Now, why my enthusiasm for debate went down over time is I started focusing more and more on just being good at shooting and running the blog and giving advice to people. I still find myself sometimes wading into the fray, especially over on Reddit. And I'd say I've got a pretty good track record there of winning debates in the eyes of the audience. 
even if the discussion usually ends with the other side just hurling insults at me and, and rather than actually arguing anymore. In any case, I just want to let you know that I have been around for a while and have a pretty long memory on how this all plays out. And I know I am by far not the been around the longest or people have been in this for decades and decades and decades. So I'm just going to give you my perspective and why I think in the next couple of years, we're going to see the end of hardware restrictions. Now, what do I mean by hardware restrictions? I mean, anything having to do with assault weapons, bans, magazine restrictions, maybe even uh, SBRs and suppressors. And why do I think that? Well, since Heller and McDonald, we've also gotten the Bruin case through SCOTUS. And my understanding is that Bruin didn't actually say anything new, but it put a serious exclamation point on the Heller decision. So kudos to Mark W. Smith, who I watch him a lot. He's got some great legal takes on the relationship between these cases. All right. Now, it, it formally laid out the standard of review for how Second Amendment cases needed to be reviewed. The explanation was very clear, even if the lower courts keep trying to quibble over it. And I think the reason they're quibbling over it about Bruin being vague is because they know that applying the standard actually written in Bruin means that the law they're, they're trying to support isn't going to stand. So they don't, they don't want to do it. And what I see happening now because of that is this cultural divide. These traditional anti-Second Amendment courts like the Ninth and the Seventh and the Fourth Circuits continue to hem and haul while stalling on releasing any decision that could wind back up at SCOTUS. All right, there are glimmers of hope in there, like uh, Judge Benitez out of California knocked down California's assault weapons ban and magazine restrictions twice, actually. And the second time, now it's been sitting in the Ninth Circuit, unanswered for like a year after it got appealed. They just they don't want to make a decision on it because they know if they make a decision on it, it's going to go to SCOTUS. And just last week, Justice McGlynn uh, put out a 168-page opinion knocking down Illinois' assault weapons ban. And again, the Seventh Circuit really doesn't want to make a decision about that. But on the other side of that, one court, the Fourth Circuit, actually did make a decision on Maryland's ban, and that is the Snope case, which is on track to head to SCOTUS at the end of this year. And I really, really hope it gets there because uh, I want that one. <laughs> I want to get rid of assault weapons bans. All right. On the other flip side of that coin is there's lots of courts who've been knocking down restrictions against citizens, uh, like things like, like people who can't buy guns unless you're older than 21, like that's going away. Things like pistol braces, bump stocks, these are all losing deals in the court. And I think the trend is we have the momentum. We have momentum that all these restrictions around uh, what you can buy are, are, are failing. They're going away. All right, so the momentum is in our favor. When you look at the big picture of Heller, McDonald, Brew, and all these cases building up since then, it tells a story. The gun control lobby is in retreat. And while they can get a win here or there in their friendly districts, all signs pour to point that eventually they're going to lose the higher courts and they're going to be forced to reckon with the fact that gun control laws as we know them today is purely a 20th century concept that's just not compatible with text, history, and tradition of constitutional rights. Now, on top of that, my perception is that in the years since President Trump's first term, We've seen a huge increase in the number of first-time gun owners across this whole spectrum of demographics and political affiliations. Whereas being a gun person used to be almost exclusively a right-wing thing, we are seeing the political left side of the spectrum now get involved. All right, either they're arming up out of fear from Trump's so-called right-wing death squads that never actually manifested, or what happened to their neighborhoods during COVID lockdowns and the summer of love with riots and protests and and lack of police response, there are many, many people who now realize that they were lied to about guns and gun ownership. And I've always felt the biggest antidote to the anti-gun antics was simply education and experience. There are exceptions to this, but it's always seemed to me that teaching someone some gun safety rules, a bit of marksmanship, and letting them actually experience the things they were ignorant about tends to soften their opinion a lot. You should take it as a sign that momentum is in your favor when the Democratic Party's candidate had to make a point to say that she was a gun owner and explicitly mentioned Glock as the tool of self-defense. The very gun demonized for years when banning handguns was a priority for lobbyists. To me, this says that even the Democratic Party knows they can't just take such a hardline stance as they used to. 
even if the big donors still want it. So with President Trump going back to the White House, he is likely to appoint two more justices to replace retiring ones, who I think is Thomas and Alito. And he may even get a crack at a third one, depending on Justice Sotomayor's health in the next few years. So this will secure a conservative majority on SCOTUS for decades. Now, taken together, I think we're going to see the, uh, the systematic destruction of hardware-focused gun control policies. Assault weapons bans, magazine restrictions are the most obvious targets. I think the next thing should probably be the Sporting Purposes Clause of the 1968 Gun Control Act, which, if you don't know, that particular phrase has the root of all kinds of, of import restrictions and limits that they get thrown out there all the time. I think we just can do away with it at this point. And the golden prize, of course, is to get rid of the 1934 NFA altogether, or at least removing suppressors and short barreled rifles and shotguns from those restrictions. I see that as an absolute win. Now, here's where I get to the downside, all right? Um, as much as I think these things are coming, I th don't think the debate is totally ever going to end. So despite my optimism around gun controls and pending failure around hardware, I expect them to pivot away from things and instead focus on gun owners themselves. In other words, if they can't limit what you can buy, they're going to try and put limits on who can buy anything. All right, why do I think that? In the big picture, when you look at how polling works around the whole gun control issues, there are things that almost everyone generally agrees on. The two obvious examples are no firearms for violent felons and removing access to the mentally disturbed. Even the pro-gun side of the aisle generally agrees with those two points going so far as to use them as shields whenever the hardware debate comes up, such as saying, we don't have an AR-15 problem, we have a mental health problem. I don't think anyone is seriously challenging the questions on a 4473 regarding drug use either. On top of that, I think the gun control crowd has some moderate success with the red flag laws. These things have sprung up all over the country in varying flavors, and none of them have seen significant legal challenge. Yes, there's been issues around implementation of the laws, especially around what constitutes enough due process or timelines for when police are going to return your firearms to you and what condition they get returned in. But overall, though, I think people accept the premise that the laws are valid. I don't agree with that. That's neither here nor there. All right. But that's kind of the precedence that we're setting. So given the public and court's acceptance of these kinds of who the person controls, I think the thing to look out for is a gradual shifting of the lines of who qualifies. We're seeing some of that play out now with some more SCOTUS cases like Rahimi and Range, where the courts are trying to draw a line between just any felon and dangerous felons. And I think we're going to see the same thing play out on the future with the creeping line of what qualifies as a red flaggable offense. I think the other thing to look out for is licensure laws. And I think this is, this is the really scary one to me because it seems like such an innocuous idea that could be beneficial on its surface. All right, think of it this way. We know that Illinois has, has the firearms ownership ID law, all right? And no one's been able to really challenge that. At the federal level, we know that there's plenty of precedents because you have the NFA and how many thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions of people have registered their NFA items with the ATF, especially this year once wait times dropped from almost a year or two days or even hours. People who bought four or five, six suppressors within like a month because they could, all right? The argument could be made that having to register something, to register yourself is not actually a deterrent, that people are willing to do it. All right, so that's the precedent. So here's how I think this could play out. Let's say someone offers a law that they want to simplify the whole rat's nest of our current legislation, all right? And they, they divide all firearms into three categories. Category one would include bolt action, lever action, pump action, long guns, as well as revolvers. This would kind of apply to the same rules we got today. Go in, fill out a form, walk out. Category two includes all semi-automatic rifles, shotguns, and handguns. Category three includes what we call NFA items today, suppressors, SBRs, short bill of shotguns and the like. Any citizen of age could go in purchase from category one, but category two and three would require some kind of license from the government that you could easily and cheaply obtain for yourself. 
And then once you had the license, you could go into any dealer and you could buy whatever you wanted that with it fell within that license simply by presenting it and they would validate it and out you go. So no more filling out 4473s, no more other forms because you have that license. On one hand, this whole idea has a lot of merit as far as simplifying things. I think a lot of people would be certainly happy to be able to walk into a dealer, pick a suppressor off the shelf, walk it to the counter, hand over a card, they would call a phone number and be like, yep, still valid, pay for it and walk out. That sounds really, really convenient, right? But on the other hand, you have to realize that this is a registry and the requirements to obtain that license could absolutely creep over time, getting more and more restrictive to the point of impossibility. In other words, even if it was really well-meaning today, always consider how such a law could be twisted in the future and used against you, okay? All right, I'm gonna wrap up there. So I don't wanna end on a dark note. Um, you know, with the election last week and incoming administration and the way that we're all going, the Second Amendment community has a, a lot of momentum going behind it with new gun owners out there from a variety of backgrounds. And I think we are in a better spot than we have been in decades. And I think we're on the precipice of having some serious wins that we've really wanted for a long time. And that's all awesome. So my caution to you is stay vigilant. Okay, even if all these great things happen, stay vigilant because the next four years could be a great time to lull you into complacency. And that is where we might run into more problems in the future. Okay, all right. Uh, I don't want to leave on a bad note. I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, there's some thinking about it a lot, a little out of character for me, kind of off the cuff, but I'm glad you stuck around to listen to it. So come by the website, everydaymarksman.co, and let me know what you think in the show notes, in the comments. All right, see you next time. Take care.